appreciate all of you being here and those visiting with us, especially grateful that you are here. Wednesday, Paul said that I might have to teach his class, and he had already gotten Bill to lead singing for him because of his throat. And as the week went along, I began wondering if I was going to have to get someone to substitute for Paul to teach his class and for me to preach for my preaching. But uh, hopefully we can get through this. My allergies have been acting up fairly uh, a whole lot. They haven't been too good lately. They've been bad. So, and I've been doped up and kind of out of it for a few days almost. Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verses 13 through verse 19. Jesus here, along with his apostles, come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. <clears throat> and Caesarea Philippi was a city that was literally built upon a foundation or a mass of rock. And here it is that Jesus stated, Upon this rock I will build my church. As he began the discussion, though, he asked his apostles, Who do men say that I am? And man at that time was willing to accept Jesus as a prophet of God, but he, they were not at that time willing to accept him as what he was, the Son of God. So he, upon hearing the answers, asked them, Who do you say that I am? So he makes the question personal to them. And of course, Peter's response is that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And each one of these words are important. We studied them in uh, previous lessons. But then we notice Jesus' response, that upon this rock I will build my church. And we've noted how that there were several different explanations about this rock that some say that it was uh, Caesarea Philippi. Others were claiming, well, it's not Caesarea Philippi, it's uh, Peter. But in reality, it's the statement that Jesus made, or that Peter made, that upon this rock, him being the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the church would be built. And it is his church showing the singular nature of it, not plural, it's not, I'm going to build many churches, but it's going to be, I'm going to build my church. And we see that it's said in the future when Jesus states this, it wasn't built during the days of the prophets. It wasn't built during the days of John the Baptist. It was built after Christ died uh, and then rose from the grave. But then... He also says, and we were studying uh, in the gates of Hades, or hell, in the King James, shall not prevail against it. And we started noticing, what does this word Hades mean? And while it might be better translated unseen realm, there is no real word that translates the Greek word Hades. But what we did notice, that at death, the spirit returns to God who gave it. The body then goes to the grave and returns to the dust of the earth. There is a separation of that spirit and, this, and uh, the body of man and each one going to their respective places. In relationship to the, that spirit though, where does the spirit live? And we note it. <coughs> We noted that there's two places. There's a place called paradise, which is a place of blessing and happiness, uh, peace, a place where we have communion with God. And then there is that place of torment, 
called Tartarus of great anguish. And so those are the two areas of that Hadean realm. Uh, that's what we looked at last week. But we didn't really set forth the scriptures to show these things to be the case. And so that's what I want us to do this morning and then take our understanding back to Matthew 16 and verse 18 where Jesus says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But very simply, when we're looking at the scriptures, we first want to look at Matthew the 23rd chapter, verse 39 through verse 43. And this is, of course, when Jesus was upon the cross. There were two thieves that were crucified with him. One of the malefactors, which was hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. First off, in looking at this thief, the thief was saved. There's some who want to claim that that was not the case. I don't know how they can understand that. Uh, but he was saved. Christ, while here upon this earth, had the power to forgive sins. He did it on many occasions in reality. Prior to this, and even here prior to his death, he still has that power to forgive sins. That's one of the things that Christ had as far as his possessions were concerned. And prior to his death, before his testament comes into existence, he had the power to give of his possessions, the forgiveness of sins, away any, upon any basis that he so desired. We see the principle of that in Hebrews 9th chapter, verses 15 through 17. That a testament is a force after men are dead. Jesus is still alive at this point in time. And <laughs> thus when Jesus says, thou sh This day thou shalt be with me in paradise, he is forgiving the thief's his sins. And he then proclaims to that thief that he would be with him in paradise. And so this place that they're going to go to upon their death is that place called paradise in the scriptures. Their bodies, though, they're going to be placed in the grave. That's what we see in uh, that passage that we looked at from Ecclesiastes 12th chapter. The body is going to go to the grave, return to the dust. But the spirit, on the other hand, in this case, the spirit of Christ and the spirit of this thief were going to go into paradise. Another passage that we need to understand along this line would be in Peter's sermon on that day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter. In verse 27, Peter is saying, because he's quoting the Old Testament, because I will not leave my soul in hell. Literally, the word here again is Hades. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And now then he begins explaining and he says, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, not hell as King James has it, but Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. Christ's body, when he died, was going to be put in the grave. But Peter is affirming here that his body would not see corruption. Again, that passage that we referred to in Ecclesiastes. It refers to that body returning to the dust from whence it was taken. 
in relationship with Jesus, that's not going to be the case though. His body is not going to see corruption. Go back to the thief on the cross. Jesus says, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. His body was put in the grave. His body saw corruption. But the body of Jesus did not see corruption because, and here's the point of Peter's lesson in Acts 2, he's going to be raised from the dead. And thus his body will not see corruption. This resurrection is going to prove him to, him to be what he claimed. And that statement of Peter in Matthew the 16th chapter and verse 16 that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The very thing, the very point that we're studying, and now which Peter affirms, here is the rock, the basis upon the building of the church. What is it? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's Peter affirming now? Well, here, Christ, you have by wicked hands taken and crucified him. His body went into the grave. His spirit returned to God, but he was raised from the grave so that his body did not see corruption. He was raised. And thus, by this, he was proved to be the Son of God. He was proved to be our Savior. As opposed to other bodies that remain in the grave. <clears throat> Another passage uh, that ties in with our study on paradise would be Acts the seventh chapter and verse fifty nine. That here Stephen is preaching this great sermon to the Sanhedrin, but they are angry at him, they rush at him, gnash on him with their teeth, take him outside of the city, and they stone him. And here in verse 59, it's talking about they stoned Stephen. Stephen, though, was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So here, when, while Stephen was being stoned, he actually had looked up into heaven, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, Acts 7 and verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Actually, this is the only time in the Bible that Jesus is referred to as standing in, at the right hand of God. All the other times he's seated. And the only explanation that we can come up with as to why the change in this is because here was the first Christian martyr and Jesus having an interest in this and showing an interest in the stoning of Stephen. And that's why he also the heavens opened up so that Stephen can see up into heaven. Another situation where you don't see, uh, that we do not see in the scriptures. But he sees thus Jesus standing there at the right hand of God. And what does he say? He says, receive my spirit. Notice he did not say receive my body. Why? Because the body was going to go into the grave. It was going to return to the dust from whence it was. But he does say receive my spirit. Why? Because the spirit was going to depart from that body. Where was the spirit going to go? Well, Stephen was going to go and hit that spirit of Stephen was going to be with Jesus. Wherever his Lord was, Jesus was, again, standing there at the right hand of God. He was in heaven. And now then, receive my spirit. His spirit was going to go to be with Christ. Now, in other places in the scriptures, as we've seen, refer to that place as paradise. Well, moving on, in 2 Corinthians 12th chapter, verses 2 through verse 5. Paul writes, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up, under, caught up to the third heaven. Now let me just mention uh, here before we go on, this I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, it's generally conceded that Paul is referring to himself during this period of time. 
And also make mention, uh, well, he said, he, let me go on just a little bit. I, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it was is not lawful for man to utter. Of uh, such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. It's amazing to me all of these stories that we hear of individuals who, oh, I died and went up and I saw, and then I came back to this earth, and then they start telling us all that it's about, what it's like. While here you have an apostle of Jesus Christ, one who is writing by the inspiration of God, and yet he says these were unspeakable words, and it's not lawful for a man to utter. And yet, even though it's not lawful for a man to utter, here's these individuals who we're to believe are able to utter them. Hogwash. That's the technical term for that. <clears throat> Now, you have to throw in these technical terms every once in a while, but uh, uh, they, that which they are seeing and experiencing is not a heavenly vision or anything likened to that. Uh, we need to understand, here's an inspired apostle of Jesus Christ who is not able to tell. Why should we think that they are going to be have, have the right to be able to tell? But, that's another study altogether. Here, biblically speaking, there are three heavens. Now Paul talks about, here's this man caught up into the third heaven. Well, the first heaven was that area of our atmosphere where the birds fly, the clouds appear in the sky, what we would refer to as our sky. That would be the first heaven. The second heaven would be where the stars are, the sun, the moon, and all of the stars, the galaxies. That would be the second heaven. The third heaven was the actual dwelling place of God. Sometimes it's described as far beyond the heavens. Why? Because you have this first heaven and this second heaven well, this is far beyond these heavens, the first and second heaven, thus far beyond the heavens. Notice the plural statement there. But the third heaven thus was the very dwelling place of God. Now, if Paul says this man, and I'm going to say it's Paul, he went up into the third heaven, the dwelling place of God. And he describes this dwelling place of God, this third heaven, as paradise. That he was caught up, verse 4 there, into paradise. And thus here he is, the dwelling place of God, yet referred to as that place of paradise. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 1 through 11, Paul would write, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be, be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also hath given us, unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the Lord and to be present, or be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or 
are bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. This is a discussion that Paul is making here of our home after we have departed this body. And if you go back in the latter part of chapter 4, he talks about the light afflictions which are but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Why? Because we don't look at the things of this world. We look beyond that to the things of the next world that home that we will have after we depart the body, that eternal home. And thus he talks about in this our desire to leave this life. Why? Because of a better life that's awaiting us. That in this life there's going to be all of those hardships and those, as he puts it, light afflictions. But there, those things will be gone a better life. And so, yes, there is that desire to leave this life for a better life. And notice verse 6 and verse 8 in particular, though. Therefore, we are always confident that, or knowing that, while as we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now notice, when the spirit is separated from the body, when death takes place, Paul is saying then that spirit is at home with the Lord. Well, where's the Lord? He's in heaven. While we are in the body, <coughs> While we are in the body, he says we are absent from the Lord. We're not in the Lord's presence in the, that sense. But when that death takes place, the Spirit then will be with the Lord. That's why it's so much far better in that afterlife than it is in this life. I can go to be with the Lord and thus what is that place? Well, scriptures refer to it as paradise. Because this paradise is a temporary place. It's not an eternal state. And that's what Paul explains there in verse 10. Until that judgment day. When we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That we receive the things done in our bodies according to that he hath done. Whether it be good or evil. What's going to take place in eternity? We go off into eternity. And when we look at other passages of Scripture, we see that those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Thus, this paradise is a temporary place, not the eternal place. And... It is a place of the spirit, but not of the body. As we looked at last week, when Christ comes in that second coming, the bodies are going to be raised from the dead, and they're going to join with their spirits. And so that eternal place will be a place where you have the body and the spirit. It's an immortal and an incorruptible body, but it's still the body along with the spirit. At this place... Paradise, you have that separation where the body is in the grave and the spirit has gone to be with the Lord. And so, it is a place for the spirit but not for the body. While heaven is an eternal place and a place for the body that has been joined back with the spirit and an incorruptible or an immortal body being given to it. In Philippians 1 and verse 23, we see actually much the same thing in discussion of what Paul is discussing there in Philippians for, or in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter. 
that here he has a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. He says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. One, that one alternative, that desire to depart, to leave this world, to go into the afterworld. With, and in doing that, to be with Christ. And he says, that's far better. The other alternative was to remain here upon this earth and glorify God or magnify God. But Paul, <coughs> Paul's desire was for death, to depart this life. Why? Because he could be with Christ then. But it was needful for them that he remain in the body. But where would he be after he died? That's the point that we're really emphasizing this morning. He's going to be with Christ, he says. Well, where is Christ? Christ is in heaven. But this place that Paul is going to go to is described within the scriptures as paradise. Revelation, the sixth chapter, verses 9 and verse 10, and then Revelation 7 and verse 15. It talks about that when he had opened the, the fifth seal. I saw, under, <coughs> I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. And then skipping on into the next chapter, chapter 7 and verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. These individuals that are being described here are saints which have been beheaded for the cause of Christ. And now then, when we look at this and read this, we start saying, where are they? Well, they are before the throne of God. They are under the altar of God. <clears throat> and they were speaking unto the Lord. And actually they were crying out to him, how long until you avenge our blood? What is it? They had been beheaded for the cause of Christ. How long, Lord, are you going to wait until you avenge the blood that we've shed? But here's where they are, before the throne of God, under the altar of God, and speaking to the Lord. And thus, that, and the very fact that they had been beheaded for the cause of Christ, their bodies had been separated from their spirit. Now then, their spirit was described as in this location. Other places, it's described as paradise. <coughs> well, these, these passages are sufficient to show a, parad a paradise where righteous souls go after death. <coughs> It is with the Lord, before the throne of God, under the altar of God. They continue to exist. They continue to know. They continue to experience things. Some try to teach a doctrine called soul sleeping. When death comes, the soul or the spirit of man just sleeps. Well, no. We've seen through these scriptures that these individuals continue to exist. They continue to know. They're conscious. They're experiencing things. It's not asleep. <coughs> and these individuals are being blessed by God, by the Father. But now then, what about Tartarus? In Luke the 16th chapter, verse 19 through 31, we have the historical account of the rich man and Lazarus. Some try to say that it's a parable. It's not. And I don't have time this morning to go into a study of why it's not, but uh, it's not a parable. It doesn't have the, doesn't hold true to a parable and what a parable is all about. But that's not the only thing. 
if it was a parable, it would um, be the only time in which a specific name was given in relationship to a parable. Here's Lazarus. We know his name. Why? Because it was a historical person who lived upon the face of this earth and that Jesus thus was talking about. But even if it was a parable, it'd still teach the same thing. It wouldn't change the teaching in it. So it really doesn't make any difference. But it's not a parable. It's a historical account. Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. He was a righteous man. He wasn't rich like the rich man. He wasn't blessed here upon this earth like the rich man. But he was a righteous man. And thus when he dies, he goes into Abraham's bosom where he is blessed. That place which we have studied at and we, the Bible refers to elsewhere as paradise. The rich man though was unrighteous as the very actions that he had in relationship with Lazarus shows his unrighteousness. He went into torment where he was, there was pain and anguish. He was in great anguish, great pain. Notice though that that rich man was tormented immediately after his death. <clears throat> During that time, his brothers were, st <coughs> were still alive here upon this earth. In fact, he wants Moses to send someone back to his brothers so that they would not come to this place of torment. And so here he was suffering torment while his brothers were still alive here upon this earth. And... As we noted last week, there was this great gulf that separated them. Even as the righteous in life are separated from the wicked or the unrighteous. Maybe not in our eyes as much as it is in God. But there are but two classes of people that we talked about last week. The righteous and the unrighteous. And there's a great gulf that separated them. There's a great gulf that separates us in life. And once death... You have Paradise and Tartarus and a great gulf separating the two. <clears throat> Thus, we start seeing the aspect of a punishment that comes after death for those who are not righteous. But also, Matthew the 11th chapter, verses 21 through 24 shows this. Jesus says, Woe to thee, crazen! Woe to thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for, for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Literally, the word is Hades there. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable that for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Here's Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum that Jesus mentioned. And they would be cast down to literally Hades until the day of judgment. Or are they being cast down to? Certainly not a place of blessing that would be referred to as paradise. But they, he's showing you're going to be tormented. Why? Because you have rejected the Christ. And so you're going to be cast down into that area of Hades that we refer to as Tartarus. That place in which they are going to be tormented because of their rejection of our Lord. One other passage along this line in regarding to Tars is Second Peter, the second chapter, and verse four, where Peter says, "For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be received or reserved unto judgment." 
here's angels that sin. I don't know when or the occasion of it. All we're told, here's angels that sin. And God did not spare them. He cast them down to hell. But here the word is not Vienna, which is generally translated hell, but it's the Greek word Tataris, Tataru, actually. That would be Tataris in our in our English. Only time that the word actually is used in the New Testament. They've been cast down. These angels that sin have been cast down to, literally, to tarts. Reserved there until the judgment. Kept there until the judgment. And thus, that's why this other area of the Hadean realm has been termed to tarts because of these angels being cast down. These angels that sin cast down to tarts where they're going to be reserved, delivered on the chains of darkness to be reserved in the judgment. And thus those individuals like that rich man that was being tormented in great anguish in that area called thus to toss. Now then, we go back to that statement of Jesus. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades literally shall not prevail against it. What is Jesus saying here? Well, we noted that he's not saying, or we have noted in previous lessons, that he's not saying that the church is going to be uh, an everlasting, or that it's never going to be destroyed, or anything like that. That's not what he's teaching here. We noted that there are other passages that show the, un the everlasting nature of the church. But that's not what he's teaching here. The gates of Hades. What is that? The Hadean realm. Not going to prevail against it. Christ is saying here, My spirit is going to go into paradise. Where is paradise? That's one of those two areas of Hades. Where is my spirit going? My spirit is going into Hades. That area of Hades called paradise. My body is going to go into the grave. It was placed in that new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But that grave is not going to prevail over me. He's saying, my body is going to be raised from the grave and my spirit is going to be coming back and join with that spirit, or that body, after three days in the grave. And so that Hadean realm that would contain my spirit is not going to stop me from establishing the church. That's what he's saying. I'm going to die. But what is, I'm going to be raised from the dead? My spirit is going to come out of that Hadean realm? and join back with my body, I'm going to be able to establish the church as a result. And that's going to prove that I am the Son of God. In Acts 17 and verse 31, because, uh, Paul is telling these Athenians that they need to repent. Why? Because God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. What is it? He was raised from the dead. What did that prove? Well, when we will turn over Romans 1 and verse 4, that God declared him to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. What is it doing? It's proving him to be the Son of God. Now, what did Peter affirm? When Jesus asked, Whom do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this foundation, what foundation? That thou art the Christ. What's going to prove that he's the Christ? The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What is it? This is the foundation upon which the church is going to be established. And that church will never be destroyed as we see in other passages of Scripture. The gates of Hades 
are not going to be able to overcome the establishment of the church. And that basis upon which the church is going to be established, which is my resurrection from the grave. And that spirit coming out of that Hadean realm, joining with his body, raised from the dead, proving him to be the Son of God, exactly as Peter affirmed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this rock, Jesus says, the rock that I am the Son of God, I will establish the church. And that Hadean realm, it won't be able to contain my spirit. I'll come out of that Hadean realm. The Hadean realm will not prevent me from establishing the church. I'll establish it in, in spite of the fact I'm going to be going into that Hadean realm. Hadean realm doesn't have any power over him. And thus, he was proven to be the Son of God with power by that resurrection. And upon that, he built the church. And that is the foundation upon which the church is being built, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And as the Christ, the Son of the living God, He's that one that we must hearken to today. Matthew, the 17th chapter. In the first few verses of that, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain. He's transfigured before them. His face was shining as the sun, his raiment white as the light. There's appeared with Him Moses and Elijah talking with Him. And we find from the book of Luke that they were talking about the resurrection. What is it? That very thing that would prove him to be the Son of God. Peter and the, uh, James and John awake out of their sleep. And Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us bear their three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While yet spake, he says, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. As they came down from that mountain, Jesus charged his apostles not to tell any man what had taken place until after his resurrection. Why? Because it was that resurrection that made him, proved him to be the Son of God and that one to whom we are to hearken. Yes, God says, this is my son, based upon what? The resurrection from the dead. And we must hear him. We must hear him when he says, here's what it takes to become Christian. That you must believe that I am, John 8 and verse 24. You must repent of your sins, with the 13th chapter, verse 3 and verse 5. You must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins or for salvation. Mark 16 and verse 16. And upon those things, you will, be, you will come into a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. But coming into that relationship means that we've got to continue to live in the way in which God wants us to live. Continue to Listen to hear Him within our life. Now, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ to become a Christian, why not listen, hearken unto Him, that Son of God? And when you do, when you're baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the Lord then will add you to the church that Jesus Christ built. If you need to repent, though, as a child of God and one who has become a member of that church, but you've sinned and you've gone astray, and you need to come back to truth, you need to come back to right, and once again, do right and be right. And why not come and repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them as we stand and sing the invitation song.